everybody. <laughs> Sorry about the goof up there. Hello, everybody. Hope you're having a great start to your week and have a great start to your year so far. Good to see everybody. Let us know in the chat who you are and where you're from. In addition, uh, today, I'm going to bring out a very special guest in just a moment. And as we do, and as we start talking, you may have questions along the way. And that's great. So let us know in the chat uh, what questions you have about today's topic. Okay. So today we're going to talk about 15 very cool ways to modify the 12 bar blues progression. So most of you are familiar with the 12 bar blues. It's iconic. It's super great. Uh, but there are other ways that we can play this that go beyond the standard 12 bar blues pattern, which is cool, uh, that you may have seen. Uh, and today I'm going to bring in a very special guest, Anthony Reiner, a friend of mine I've known for many, 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 many years, uh, exceptional guitar teacher, particularly on blues, but in general, a uh, great guitar teacher and uh, a longtime friend of mine. Anthony, welcome. Oh, you're muted. You're, you're, there we go. Uh, hey, Tomas, thanks for having me. Excited my about uh, the topic at hand, of course, since blues is my the thing that I'm, I've been doing for many, many years now. So looking forward to it. Great. So, uh, Anthony, as you know, in blues music, the 12 bar blues is not necessarily set in stone. It's often kind of taught that way, but it, it, in real music, it's always not, it's not always that way. And sometimes blues musicians modify or embellish uh, the standard 12 bar blues chord progression to create unique variety to blues music. And as you heard, I just promised everybody <laughs> watching that we would share with them or you would share with them 15 cool ways that this can be done so maybe you can walk us through 15 different embellishments or variations or alterations of the standard 12 bar blues chord progression. Right. So I have the most important ones here at hand um, to go through. And you will see that we, when we will progress towards the, uh, the, the more um, complex ones, it, it builds on the first one. So, um, it's a great checklist for yourself if you're watching live or you're watching this um, later to go through to see what kind of steps you missed out on or what kind of progressions you take for granted. And uh, so let's get started. I have a funky looking whiteboard right here. So it's a bit of a goofy thing here, but it works okay. And we'll start out with the first progression that everyone starts uh, out with as uh, normally people go through these steps um, while learning blues. So I'm um, notating the blues and the key of A. So we're starting with one chord, which is A7. Then we go to the D7 chord. This means repeat the previous measure, um, this sign. Then we go to the A7 chord. A7 chord again, then we have E7, D7, and A7, and then we have the turnaround chord at the end, the E7 chord. Now, this is the first commonly played uh, blues progression that almost everyone starts out with. We can do many creativity things with it, and if there's time at the end, I'll share some of those as well. But yeah, Anthony, sorry, you... sorry, to inter sorry to interrupt, Anthony. The oh, whiteboard, wow. the whiteboard is backwards for us. You, you oh, no? <laughs> um, that's probably because of my settings. Let me try to fix it right here. There we go. Oh. Perfect. Oh. Yes, <laughs> it's gonna be really <laughs> annoying for uh, the viewers if it's not. Yeah, uh, we didn't have to get their mirrors out and look at it. <laughs> it's good now. Go ahead. All right. Perfect. So we have the A7 chord. This sign mean, means to repeat the previous measure. So we have it for four measures. Then we have D7 chord on measures five and six again. A7, two measures again. And then we have the E7, D7, A7, and then the turnaround chord E7 again. So this is the most commonly played blues progression that almost every beginner 
starts out with. Now, let's get moving to the second variation um, because it's also common to, to not have this turnaround happening here and to just insert another A7 chord, just play this chord twice in a row because sometimes this E7 chord, this five chord, this turnaround, it might sound too cheery for what you want to accomplish with your blues progression. So a lot of the early blues guitarists, like the really early ones, like uh, early 20th century, they wouldn't play this turnaround. They would just play uh, this A7. And even the concept of a 12th bar blues progression was not always the thing they followed. So it's um, good to also listen to the early uh, blues masters because you'll see that the turnaround uh, sounded too cheery for them. Most of the time they just hit it this one chord at the end of their blues. And it's it wasn't always the the 12 bar, sometimes they even play the 13 bar and there are many examples which we don't have time to go deep into no, because it's not a topic at hand for today. But this is like a, a second thing you can start to practice, um, a second variation. And then we'll get into this measure two. A lot of people probably know this as well but we can play the D7 chord over here. And um, here it's, it's just the same chords as we play in measure five and six and also measure uh, uh, 10, that would be. So um, it's just a D7 chord. And we were talking about how it sounds cheerier to play the E7 chord at measure 12. It's the same thing. If we have a D7, the four chord in measure two, it sounds also more cheerier and it breaks up the, these um, four bars of the one chord, especially if there are no turnaround in the end, at the end of the progression, this D7 chord breaks down um, this, this whole thing. So there's more variation. And this is also really common. Um, an example of this is Eric Clapton. Um, uses a lot of uh, this four chord, but, but there are many, many examples. Um, this is really common also as well. And I see Jeffrey, uh, thanks for noting my marker is out of ink. So if you have any trouble of following, this might be uh, difficult. So let me get uh, a different marker. So maybe you can share some of your expertise um, while I'll refresh the marker, Thomas. <laughs> sure. Well, what I found intriguing, uh, Anthony, was something that you just mentioned in passing. You talked about a 13-bar blues going back in history of the early 20th century blues masters at the time, that it wasn't always 12-bar blues. And sometimes it was, you know, 10 bars or even eight bars or, you know, a, a random number of bars. So in this case, he, he referred to a 13 bar blues. I think Anthony Reiner should do a video in the future on his YouTube channel on the 13 bar blues. I think that would be awesome. So I, just, so I don't know if you heard me, Anthony, but maybe in the future you'll do a video on the 13 bar blues and find some cool old, old school examples uh, that you can right. share in the future. That'd be great. Yeah, that's a good idea. But the early, <coughs> sorry, the early blues masters, they are, they were pretty good, actually. They were pretty good guitarists. And you would think like at the beginning of the blues, things were just evolving. And But, but there were some astonishing examples of uh, guitarists that people who study them, they find that it's almost... Um, it's almost impossible to get really into that style a hundred percent to copy that style. Um, and these guys knew, knew what they were doing. Uh, even, even though things weren't as progressed, uh, into more concrete structures as they are uh, nowadays. So thanks for mentioning this to me, Jeffrey and the chat. So, 
I got a new marker, so this should be all uh, jelly again. So here in the second measure, we have the D7 chord as explained earlier. And then let's move on to more complex things. So most people have this down, but there are many more chords we can add and even creativity examples we can do. So if you want, I can share some. Uh, with you because it makes the whole 12 bar really more intriguing to play and um, for example one of the really cool things we can do is here in measure 6 at the D sharp diminished 7 chord so if you don't know what a diminished 7 chord is you can just play the D7 chord um, with the root note on the fifth string um, and I'm talking about the voicing with the fifth on the fourth string I'll show you um, if you want uh, how to finger it but that's a really commonly played voicing of this D7 chord and then we can just add one note here um, we can add just the D sharp note on the fifth string with our middle finger and uh, the other fingerings remain the same. So this D sharp diminished seventh chord, it's a really harsh sounding chord, but that's what makes it so cool. So we're um, evolving more towards jazzier sounds, which is cool um, for people who want to get into this. And not only if you want to play jazz, but these are some examples of 12 bars that are also played in, in many blues styles. It breaks up this whole um, measure five and six thing and it moves forward. It moves the progression forward, especially because we have an uh, ascending bass line from the D7 to the D sharp um, in the bass, from the D note to the D sharp in the bass. So if you don't want to, uh, if you want me to play those chords, that's fine. Uh, if people in the chat so, say no, we, we get how to play a D-sharp diminished seven, seven chord, that's fine as well. Um, in the meantime, just let me know in the chat if you want me to uh, play the fingerings and play some examples. In the meantime, we can just go to the next example and just add uh, the turnaround back in at the fifth, um, sorry, at the, the last measure here. And this is, of course, steering this progression back uh, upwards. So we have more cheerful sounding uh, and more um, things progress more. They evolve more um, in such um, sort of a progression. Um, so this is really common to do. We can also add this chord here and break up this second measure and then also play this D sharp diminished seven chord here. So that would be a really cool ID. And I uh, see Jace in the chat just added, I just tried it out myself, it sounds awesome. Well, cool to hear Jace. And again, if you have any questions about fingerings of these chords, I share, um, I'll also share some resources with you at the end of the video. So if you don't know how to play all of these, um, I have a free book on the website that deals with the exact fingerings of these. Anthony, I have a question about right. the, the D sharp diminished seven, the D sharp fully diminished seven. Are you suggesting that this chord replaces for the whole measure what would have been the D7 chord? Or are you saying that the D7 chord might exist for half of the measure, perhaps beats one and two, and then beats three and four goes from D7 to D sharp diminished seven? It looked like on paper when you sketched it out that it was the whole measure. But you, you right. want a chord uh, to cut the measure in half, so it's D7 on measure five, measure six starts, D7 and then continues D sharp diminished seven for the end of measure six. Right. Before we get back to the A7. I'm not sure which one you intended, but both I know both good are question. possible. Yes, good question. So um what I intended actually was to play the D sharp diminished seven from the start of measure six, but both can work. So you can, as you men mentioned, start out the D7 chord 
right at the beginning of major six and then progress towards this D sharp diminished seven. And um, it's always this way with harsher sounding chords like this uh, diminished seven chord or altered chords. The more tense a chord sounds, the easier it is to, well, the harder, sorry, the harder it is to get away with it if you start it earlier. So if you give, give this chord four beats of time, it's, it's going to evoke a lot of tension. And if you're into this, then it's cool because a lot of people like this song, but if you don't really like this tension building um, to have it here for four measures, you can just play two measure, uh, two, two beats, sorry. Uh, if, if you don't like the four beats of D sharp diminished seven, you can have just two beats of D7 and then two beats of D sharp diminished seven, like you um, mentioned. And of course, with measure two, it's a bit different because we have to break this measure up. So it would be like two beats of D7, two beats of D sharp diminished seven, or any other combination of beats as you want, of course. All right. So I see people tuning in from everywhere here in the chat and uh, it's cool to see uh, everyone being present in this, uh, in this live stream because it's a great topic to talk about. So if you have any question for me to talk about later on, um, I'll be more than happy. But for now, we're just going to continue because like Tom has said, there are many things we can do with this 12 bar. and. Many of these structural things are things people know or you just stumble upon them on the internet. But because we're going through um, all of this and the logical progression, it's easy to follow where you maybe have some gaps in your knowledge. And that's exactly why I'm going through these uh, examples right now. So the next thing we could do is... Um, uh, and the last two measures where we're going to the turnaround chord, the E7 chord, is we could add a little, what I call a, a four chord turnaround progression. And instead of playing A7, E7, we could play A7, then go to the D7 chord, the four chord here. And then instead of going to the E7 right away, we are going to play A7, uh, in the beginning of the last measure and then go to the E7 chord. So this whole four chord turnaround, what I call it, um, also progresses uh, this whole four chord thing more forward. It steers this turnaround more forward. So when the one chord begins again, we have an even uh, greater feeling of... Um, was the word um, the height of, of this the climax the climactic point of the e seven chord? Yeah, if so I can comment, is, if, I, if I can comment yeah. just on that real quick, what you just showed, uh, that's a really cool thing to do at the end, and one of the reasons why that's so powerful is what Anthony just mentioned is that it creates this more climactic. It pushes you forward because each chord is lasting two beats instead of a whole measure or or whatever so the rate at which the chords change which is that the term for that's called harmonic rhythm I, anthony i know you all know all this stuff but i'm just for those who don't know um harmon the harmonic rhythm increases and when harmonic rhythm increases when the chords change at a faster rate what happens is it pushes everything forward and it creates more of a buildup, more tension for a climactic point. And that sends us all the way back to measure one. We're back at the one chord on the E7. So that, that's why that feeling has, that's how the feeling is working to propel everything forward. Yeah, great. Go ahead, Anthony. All right. So this is a progression that a lot of uh, guitarists use. And it's a great one. I use it all, the, all of the time. We can also swap the D7 with the D9 chord to have more smoother feeling. And uh, if you have this progression, you can even add chords in between here and it becomes uh, chromatically speaking, a chromatic ascending bass line if you would 
for instance, add this one over here. So you can add a A7 slash C sharp chord in between the A7 and then the D9 or D7 if you want. But D9 works even better because there's a nicer voice leading in there. And um, the same thing with um, going here, um, going further then, instead of going back to the A7 chord in the last measure, um, we're progressing chromatically from, so that would be A to C sharp to D. And then we're going to add the D sharp um, diminished seven again, that is. So that would be uh, this one. D sharp diminished seven and it progresses really nicely into the E seven chord. So I'll probably lost some people over here with all these, uh, well, these are not so complex chords, but they have more of complex. They have um, names with more complexity. So if you want me to explain some of these chords or play them on the guitar, but yeah, it has a really nice bass line. So thanks for putting it in the chat. So it's a, e, uh, a C sharp, D, D sharp, E bass line. So which is what a lot of bass guitar players would play during those uh, last two measures of this progression here. So it's a really cool progression, uh, this one. All right, so, so let me know if you need more, um, if you're live with us and you need more about uh, this progression. If everyone here is at a really good level and you know these chords, I don't have to delve into, but uh, don't shy away from asking for further clarification or if I need to play those chords. All right, so the next thing we could do to build more momentum, build nicer sounding, cheerier sounding, sometimes even a bit jazzier sounding uh, chords in our 12 bar progression is to uh, play the, the ninth chord here. So that would be a ninth chord and measure two. And then every D7 chord would be swapped out with a ninth chord together with uh, the E7 chords could be played also as E9. And what this does is it adds more of a soulful feeling to our blues progression. So if you watch movies or maybe you're living in the US and you go to these gospel um, celebrations, uh, then a lot of gospel music it sounds really cheery because, you know, there's this whole uplifting vibe happening. And uh, dominant seven chords, they sound quite harsh. They have a bluesy, harsh sound. So by swapping them with a ninth chord, which is more soulful, jazzier sounding, this whole thing uh, suddenly starts to feel more um, smooth, jazzier, soulful, uplifting. And if you try this at home, you will find this to be a really nice progression uh, to play here. All right. And Jeffrey says in the chat, I think it will be a good idea to play it also so everyone can understand it quickly. All right. So I'll play it just on my strat here. And um, it's a really nice progression, like I mentioned. So uh, A7. <laughs> could be played as an open chord and then the D9 chord could be played over here at the fifth fret so I'm playing the root note I'm playing uh, so it's here on the A string with my middle finger then my index is playing the D string fifth foot sorry fourth fret as the F sharp note then um, my ring finger, third finger, is at the G string, fifth fret, the C note, and then my pinky finger, finger is at the B uh, string, fifth fret, so the E note, that would be. And I sometimes even play 
this high E string because it's right here as a unison from the B string. So that would be in the second measure, this D9 chord, then we're going back to the A7 chord. diminished 7 chord and uh, as explained before there's like this fingering where we can just put our fingers on the D7 chord and then just with adding one finger we go we change from the D7 to the D sharp diminished 7 chord so that fingering would be this D7 chord voicing where we are playing here with the index finger, the fifth fret on the A string, the a, uh, D note that is, then we're playing on the D string, the seventh fret, that is the A note, then um, with the index finger, we're playing the G string, fifth fret, and then with the pinky finger, we're playing the uh, B string, seventh fret. And then if I just add this figure here, this middle finger on the sixth fret. We have this D sharp diminished seventh thing going on. And then we were back to the A7. Alright. And then uh, for the last four measures, we have the E9. We have this turnaround thing happening. So we have an A7, A, uh, A7 uh, slash uh, C sharp, then D9, then D uh, sharp, uh, what was it again? D sharp diminished 7, and then the E7, or you could play E7 sharp 9 as well. So this whole thing is. And then, or sometimes they go back to the one chord, to the A7 before uh, ending at five chords. So it's. So that's a really nice bass line, like uh, Tom has put it in the chat we have. Anthony, one thing that you did on the guitar, uh, but you didn't yet talk about, but I think you just kind of do it naturally, is when you take a chord, let's any chord, <clears throat> A7, D7, whatever, uh, and then you slide down a fret, or you go down a fret, and then you play play it there, and then you slide back up to where you were. I know it's just an embellishment. That's not that's why yes. it's not on the chart, but maybe some people might be looking for that chord on the whiteboard and then don't see it and are a little confused if you want to just very briefly just mention what you're doing there yeah uh, it's uh, good that you mention it i call it a chord slide so it's like a nifty little embellishment like you said it's like if you play a7 over here as an open chord we could just play uh, the whole thing one fret lower <laughs> And then slide into the right chord because we don't want to stay hanging for this long as just for to give an example. We would do it naturally uh, very quickly. And the same thing with this D9. It sounds really nicely if you just start out at the fourth fret and then slide into the fifth fret. And then this thing is also a really cool embellishment that is happening a lot with this more soulful kind of blues progression. So if you have the D9 chord over here, you can play it also with the high E string added to the chord. So we would play like a little bar with our third finger on the G, B and high E string. And then we can slide this little bar two frets up and then back down. Uh, a cool thing uh, thank 
not for mentioning it so much because I, I do it all of the time, but I, you know, it sometimes becomes so natural. But but uh, blues guitar students, I tell them it's chord slide. So this is what the the, what I, the term that I use for this. All right. So if there are any more suggestions in the chat, please keep them coming. If not, we'll just keep on moving and uh, in the meantime we, we also covered a lot of ground already and I want to uh, make sure we have some time at the end to get the, into more of these embellishments because that's what makes it sound so nice. Um, but one of the smaller things that a lot of people um, might forget is that here um, and in the case of the E9 and D9, it sounds really nicely when it's stuck in the progression, but it's not a chord we can play here at the 12th measure. Of course, um, I shouldn't say you can't play it. Of course, you're the boss. <laughs> you can do what you, with your music, whatever you want. But um, theoretically speaking, we wouldn't uh, play uh, like the E9 chord here. Uh, because it's not, it breaks away the tension. So here we want a harsh sounding chord, um, like the E7 chord, or e, um, E7 sharp 9 is a great chord. And for people who know about jazz music theory, the, the music theory, the kind of music theory that embodies also blues playing for quite a bit. They know this is an altered chord because this sharp nine is an altered uh, tone. And it's what, what an altered tone actually does, it build, builds up a lot of tension. So if you don't know what E7 sharp nine is, it's, uh, they call it the Hendrix chord uh, and guitar slang, so to speak. A lot of people call it the Hendrix chord, so we might have seen it. And the Hendrix tune, if you ever played some of his riffs, the, um, what, what's the name? If you know, you can put it in the chat. I'm just thinking, uh, uh, it's not Foxy Lady, it's uh, Purple Haze. So the, the riff from Purple Haze features this E7 sharp 9 chord. So it's a perfect chord to put at the end because it builds a lot of tension. And speaking about this E7 sharp 9 chord and these uh, altered chords, whenever we have um, chords going from the 5 to the 1, we can add a really harsh sounding tension like a sharp 9, flat 9, sharp 5, or flat 5. And if we add those tones to our chords, then it's uh, we're talking about altered chords and we're building up a lot of tension and a lot of uh, modern guitar blues guitar players do this but then we're getting more into the theory like the territory of like blues jazz playing and uh, this might be a bit too much for some people but i just wanted to get into this e7 sharp 19 over here all right um then th Talking about getting a bit more into blue, uh, blues, jazz playing, like what we could do with caution. I'll talk about this just briefly why we want to add caution here as we could play uh, the A13 chord instead of the A7. And what would happen if we just play A13 all of the time instead of this A7? that it would sound really, really tensionful, harsh, tensionful, jazzy. So if you're into this sound, try it out. If you like it, you can experiment with it, of course. But sometimes just using this 13th chord all of the time is just too much. So um, you will probably find it's too much. So And then in this case, you can just add it some where in between, like even if you play like two measures as Tom Hiss, two beats, sorry, as Tom Hiss um, suggested for the measure two, we can do it here at the measure three. Also, then we would play two, two beats, sorry, of A7 and then two beats of the A13 chord. And that would break up this whole too jazzy sounding uh, environment of uh, using it everywhere. But of course you can do it if you want. 
and uh, if you're into like a modern jazzy sound why not so um, this is really cool and then I have one more um, thing I want to mention about these 12 bar progressions before we get into more Q&A and of course I'll share my uh, ebook you can download at the website where you can find all of these chord voicings to try out it and we get um, at the end um, a bit more into embellishments because there are some things I want to add about adding more embellishment this is more like music theory and how to play it how, how to uh, how these chords are formed throughout 12 bar progression but with the guitar, I'll add some really cool things at the end you can do. So the last thing that I want that to mention is to add this. Um, it's, it's even more jazzy or something. Uh, they call it a blues jazz progression. Essentially, it's this um, 6 two, five, one progression at the end. So instead of playing like an E, sorry, A7 chord, here and measure seven. We could go back to the A7 chord, but a lot of times we even say see players uh, play an E, sorry, A major seven chord. And this is a chord that uh, is played a lot in jazz and it sounds really uh, cool if we just break this whole dominant seven progression with the major seven chord so it's really cool to do and then in this measure we're going to the sixth chord and it's a harsh sounding sixth chord it's an f sharp seven sharp nine so this is an altered chord again so you could use the same fingering as with this chord the hendrix chord but just move it two frets higher up on the neck then on in this measure, we'll play the two chord, and if we're in the key of A, the two chord will be B minor seven, and then we're going to play here the five chord, E seven sharp nine. So this is like these four bars are like um, a little turnaround in their own respect. So we have like a 5 to 1 progression and uh, uh, this is really cool to do. So sorry, it's a 6 to 5 progression. So we have the 6 chord, we have the 2 chord, we have the 1 chord. And then, um, sorry, we have the 6 chord, we have the 2 chord, we have the 5 chord. And then we're back here at the 1 chord. And then we could just play this whole thing over again, but... We, we play the chords faster, leap paced. So um, instead of using them in four measures, we have them here in two uh, measures. So it would be F sharp seven right over here. Then we go at beat three to the BM seven. And we have the A seven, uh, sorry, B minor seven. Um, where am I? E7, sorry, E7 sharp 9 um, over here. And just let me play it because I just want to make sure I don't mess it up. So I'll play this whole chord progression from the beginning. So it's A7, D7, or D As you see, as you can hear, it's a bit jazzy or so. It's 13 or an altered chord. And then we go back to the D9, measure 5, D sharp diminished 7. And then we go to this A major 7. Then to, uh, sorry, it's one measure. F sharp. Back to the 
blues jazz progression so a lot of people play it uh, at jam sessions also that's why it's a good one to know because if you're only playing like normal blues the, the less complex blues progressions it's uh, one you don't come across that often and i made a really um, a stupid mistake over here of course we have to go back to the one chord here we have a7 that we would play this f sharp seven sharp nine here then we have b minor seven and then e7 or e7 sharp nine something harsh sounding to go back to the one chord and as you can see it becomes a bit more complex but of course the it's just a logical progression we followed here during the beginning of the live stream we started adding one chord so if you just started playing guitar yesterday's this is not nothing to worry about <laughs> at the moment so you just start out where you're at and you build up your foundation from from where you are at um, it's, it's not really productive to take too big of a leap if you're uh, not there yet as a player. But for people who are into this kind of stuff and are playing for longer and want to get into it, I hope uh, this helps. And I wanted to talk about this embellishments and adding riffs and licks. So if there are uh, questions um, in the chat, we can also look at this. Uh, Jeff says more mic gain, please, Anthony. So uh, I just turned it up. So let me know if it's improving. All right. So about the embellishments, it's really good to know your theory, the, the theory that we just looked at. But it's also really cool to be creative with all of this stuff. So, for example, a lot of people, they start with this kind of uh, blues riff. And if you play this blues riff, you can't play the chord because you're only one guitar player unless you're playing with another guitar player. You have to make choices. But this also means that we can swap these two things. So we can play one measure of the chord and then the next measure we can play the riff, for example. So um, I'll give you just an example of how this would sound like. see it, it gives a more lively feel than just playing this chord all of the time. The same thing with all the other chords we looked at, like this D9 chord. You can start out with playing a D7 chord and then adding in the D9 chord, or you could play the D7 chord over here, or even just a little blues riff and the key of D. going to this D9 chord and then using this chord slide as we mentioned previously. The D sharp diminished 7 we looked at as a really uh, cool chord because we can move it up and down um, the fretboard because it, it, the four notes that are in this chord can be played in uh, different voicings and if we do that uh, it's really nice on the guitar, we can just move it up uh, three frets higher. And this is like the same chord that we played here, but uh, we have uh, different uh, notes. The, the order of notes are changed. So these are symmetrical. That's uh, what those are called, symmetrical chords. And it's really cool to experiment with. It has a more of a vintage jazz sound like uh, the jazz purists love this kind of sound like the Wes Montgomery sound and he does it all over the fretboard I think it's a bit much if you do it all of the time but um, as we mentioned you can experiment with it and if you want to break up the score then uh, and to uh, arpeggios of course we can do this and add arpeggios or licks in between the chords and experimenting with all of this together uh, might be a bit much 
And that's why I have this ebook that I'm going to share in, in a moment that you can download on the website for free. But you have, you just can start out with this little blues riff over here. And then add this A7 chord. Or if you're experimenting with a bit more complex chords like D9, you go, go from D9 to D sharp diminished 7 and then try to slide it up three frets higher to start out with. Don't make it too complex at first, or try to use the A13 chords instead of the A7. And a lot of people think improvisation is for lead guitar playing, but as you see, we can experiment with so many different chords, different ornaments, uh, and or rhythm guitar playing as well. And I think it's really important as a blues guitar player, especially to also get into rhythm guitar uh, deeply, because a lot of people, they stay on the surface playing lead, but... If you play a minor pentatonic scale like rock players play over blues progression, it's not really blues-based playing. Uh, the thing that makes blues sound like blues is the rhythms that are behind the lead guitar playing. So I think it's really um, important and thou shall not overlook. <laughs> All right. Great stuff. So, All right. Thank you. Do you... Uh... Do you, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, um, but do you have maybe some songs or so that you can recommend people listen to that have some of these alterations in them? So if someone wanted to hear what you're talking about in a song, can you, can you think of some? Can you name some that have some of these variations? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have, uh, I have a lot of um, guitarists to listen to because I'm mostly listening to like a whole record and um, the names of the particular songs might not be uh, so important here, but you can listen to anything that is like uh, played by Matt Schofield for the more modern sounding blues. We have Robin Ford, also more blues jazz based. Um, we have um, uh, John Schofield, uh, it's not, he's not related to Matt Schofield, but he's also more into this modern type of thing. And then for the earlier things we talked about, uh, the most basic forms of 12 bar progressions, you can listen to any blues player, basically like Steve Ray Vaughan, Eric Clapton. Um, there are a lot of um, blues players um, or even rock based blues players like um, the the guy with his Gibson guitar with the heavy vibrator, I know, you know, uh, but the name uh, escapes uh, from my mind. Are you talking uh, about Zach Wilde? No, not Zach Wilde. Um, I'm talking about uh, Gary Moore. That's the one. Ah, it's Gary Moore, yeah. <laughs> Just forgot. Um, yeah, Gary Moore and then... Um, B.B. King is a bit more different sometimes because he plays a lot of uh, major sounding lead, like he plays a lot of uh, major pentatonic. So it's a great study, B.B. King, um, but you'll find him to be a bit different than the earlier blues masters or people like Steve Ray Vaughan. Um, you have also uh, the three kings of the blues, yeah, thanks, Dave Tram, Gary Moore. So we have the three kings of the blues, Freddie King. Uh, we have also um, Albert King. Albert King, and then uh, the third king is BB King, of course. And then um, the earlier blues masters, it's um, Robert Johnson, of course, Charlie Patton, 
So people like this, all right. Great. We have a question, uh, Anthony, uh, on Facebook from Mark. He's asking um, the diminished seventh chord in played in different places. Does that equal different inversions of the same chord? Right. So yes, that's exactly what's happening. So if you're playing like this diminished seventh chord, like the one we looked at earlier during the live stream, if you play it three frets higher, you will see that these are the exact same notes. That's why it's called a symmetrical chord that are played in the chord. And if we play it three frets higher or lower on the neck, we can go both ways until we run out of frets on the guitar. Uh, if you play it at these places, we have the ex exact same notes, but uh, inverted differently. Exactly. And Mark, the reason why that is the reason why that exists it doesn't exist on most chords but on the fully diminished seventh chord on augmented chords uh for those type or on a tritone dyad those type of entities as anthony said are symmetrical and what anthony means by symmetrical is that the intervals between all the notes are identical okay so in the case of a fully diminished seventh chord, the distance between each note is a minor third, three frets on the guitar. So because there's it's symmetrical, three frets, three frets, three frets, three frets, three frets, three frets, there any one of those notes could be the root. Okay, we, we can we can assign any one of those notes as the root. That wouldn't be the same with let's say in you know a dominant seventh chord or a, a minor triad or something like that. The hierarchy is different. So because the distances are the same the inversions of all of those chords are literally the same fingering, just moved up or down three frets, as Anthony said. Um, the getting a little nerdy now, but the fact that the, I am not Anthony uh, the, and not you, Mark, uh, the, the fact that e any one of those notes could be the root is useful because we can use that chord to modulate to other keys because we could assign any one of those as the root so that's a pretty cool thing. So like a B diminished seventh chord, it you know would resolve generally from B to C, right? The next chord would typically be C or C minor or whatever. But the D note of the B diminished seventh chord, that can resolve up to E flat. So it's it's a I'll stop with the nerdiness now, but it's a really cool thing that you can do with fully diminished seventh chords. And the same goes with augmented triads as well. All right, very good. So, thank you for that question, Mark. Anthony, you have a uh, you have an ebook, or you have something to share? I believe. Yeah, yeah it's a really right. cool guide. So it's been there for many years on the website, and I think if you don't have it yet, you should download it because there are many cool licks, riffs, and chords, in. and also the thing we mentioned here with the ornamentation and, and going from chords to licks or adding this chord slide. It's all laid out in tablature, so you don't have to guess on the fingerings. Like uh, I can guess some people uh, that are present here on the live stream sometimes might have questions about the fingerings and the voicings that I use. So these are all in this uh, ebook. All right. Very so cool. you can download at the website bestbluesguitarlessonsonline.com slash bluesrhythmguitar. If you go to the website, you'll see it first thing on the homepage as well. Very cool. Very cool. So I also have a uh, free ebook for you guys. It is on doubling your guitar speed while cutting your guitar practice time in half. It's also totally free. Just go to tomhess.net forward slash speed and you can download it right now immediately. It's very useful. There have been thousands of people have downloaded this over the years and uh, it's, it's very cool, very useful. tomhess.net forward slash speed speed so thank you everybody thank you anthony for hanging out here today for all of the insights that you've shared all the wisdom all the examples it was really great uh and i pre i particularly like the 6251 thing um with the a major seventh chord in there i actually didn't know that one i, I know what 6251 is of course but i didn't i never had seen it in that context before so i definitely learned something today hope you all did too Thank you, Anthony. It was awesome as always. Good to see thank you. you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. And thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us live and for the questions and 
it's really great. So take care, everybody. Have a super awesome day, and we'll see you guys next time. Yeah. <laughs>